Well, here we are again. Thank you for uh, coming and joining us here at Messiah Reformed Church. Once again, I'm Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks, pastor of Messiah Reformed Church in Omaha, Nebraska, and we are with you for some of the uh, closing uh, installments now. I've decided that uh, after all the work that we have been doing on this uh, second coming series, that uh, I think what we're going to do is with this installment, and this is installment 13 or 14? 13. It's 13? Installment 13, because I don't count, but they do, that uh, we're going to start the Olivet Discourse right now. And that might take a couple of installments to get all the way through that, a lot of material to cover. But I think you're going to appreciate, especially if you've hung in there and you've been through all of the previous 12 installments on the Second Coming series where we have dealt with all kinds of issues. The primary issue, of course, being uh, the timing and the nature of the Second Coming of Christ in the first century. And uh, rather than us jumping right into the Olivet Discourse, you'll see right away that it was important for us to review things like the heavens and the earth. How does the Bible teach about that phrase. What does it always mean? Is it always physical, cosmological, or is it metaphorical and Hebraic in regards to um, the, 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 the picture of language and slang uh, that was there within the Hebrew culture and in which the prophets of the Old and the New Covenant spoke and the Lord Jesus spoke in regards to his apostles and his apostles spoke after that. You'll see that it's, it's been good that we went through uh, a couple of installments on the last days, the latter days, the last times and that kind of a thing so you'll be you'll be glad that you went through all of this with us you'll be glad that we touched on the uh, aspect of the so-called rapture which is the harpazo because that is in the Olivet Discourse and of course the nature of the harpazo not exactly what is popularly expressed out there and uh, you know we spent lots of time with that subject spent lots of time uh, with uh, other aspects that we've been dealing with including dealing with the demise of the devil you know and we're gonna see a little bit of that in the Olivet Discourse we're going to see the aspects of with the parousia comes not only resurrection but the judgments that take place uh, co-terminus with the parousia and of course if it's all happening in the fifth century and it did are there ongoing implications for that and the answer is yes there are there are ongoing implications for that uh, I have uh, expressed to you before that the Bible teaches, and I'm going to get into it while we're in the Olivet Discourse, that there's a difference in the eternal aspect of what we think of in regards to the movement of time and the created aspects of time. When God created uh, the sun, moon, and the stars, for instance, and gave means by which time might be measured, according to Genesis, the first chapter, and on the fourth day when he did that, that creating, that then time was an understood or could be understood, known, and measurable thing where outside of God's creation of uh, the universe, for instance, there is just his eternal now, his eternal now. And if there is anything like the concept of time, it's not like what we deal with here on earth, the tick-tock of the clock, the motion of the, uh, the calendar as it moves from one year to the next, to the, to the next, and so many days in a week, so many hours, you know, in a day. All that changes when we move into God's eternal aspect. And we'll try to bring up uh, a lot of that as we go through the Olivet Discourse because it's some of the passages are going to demand well what is going on right here is this happening is this time of judgment and resurrection is that happening in earthly time or is it outside of time and we'll demonstrate what the Bible means by that and take you to some very interesting passages in regards to all that so all of this that we've been doing over the last 12 installments has been for the sake of all of you so that we could get ready, get you ready, so that we could take a, a profitable trip through the Olivet Discourse. And the best place to start, I think, in the Olivet Discourse is to start in Matthew. I like Matthew's version best. There's Matthew 24, and there's Mark 13, and there's Luke 21. In John's Gospel, John does not include an Olivet Discourse. Um, many scholars believe that Mark's was the very first Gospel, so the 13th chapter of Mark would have been um, the first one written. Uh, I take a little bit of an issue with that. I, I think that Matthew actually was written first, and I think Mark pulled off of Matthew, but that's just my opinion, and that's really all it is. And men uh, who consider Mark to have been the first Gospel, that's all that is for them, too. It's opinion, and one of the things that drives that opinion is a presupposition in regards to a smaller amount of information, less information. And as you know, 
uh, there's only 16 chapters uh, in Mark's gospel and half of that, uh, you know, the last 20 verses or so in, in the 16th chapter were added on hundreds of years later. We're not a part of Mark's original writing and that's another discussion uh, for another time. But really the bulk of Mark's gospel contains 15 chapters as we understand chapters as they're laid out uh, in our Bibles. Now Matthew has more information in his Olivet Discourse uh, than, than Mark does and Luke's information on the Olivet Discourse, Luke 21, is really important for us because it really helps us to interpret uh, Matthew 24, Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse, helps us to interpret different things in there. Like for instance, we're going to come across in Matthew 24, 15 where Jesus is going to say to the the boys, therefore, when all of you see the abomination of desolation, he'll talk about that spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, Luke is going to give us a, a picture and an interpretive grid in that exact same context, and instead of him referring to Jesus speaking to uh, his, his four disciples on the Mount of Olives as as when you see the abomination of desolation, he's going to take in that exact same context. We'll show it to you. And instead of using the phrase abomination of desolation, which is from the book of Daniel, which is a Jewish phrase, which is charged with meaning if you're Hebraic, if you're not, and if you're a Gentile, and Luke was writing to Theophilus, a Gentile, well, Theophilus is not going to understand abomination of desolation. I need a, a teacher to help me understand what that is. So what Luke is going to do is instead of saying abomination of desolation, He's going to say, when all of you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you can know that its desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And we'll see that it's in the exact same context in Luke 21 as it appears in Matthew 24's context. But the terminology has changed up a little bit. I love it when the, when the Bible does that. And you can see, well, what's the abomination of desolation? Well, you know, the abomination of desolation is not about anybody going into a rebuilt temple, going into a rebuilt holy of holies and taking their seat, some fictitious antichrist person, and then, you know, three and a half years of great tribulation start. No, that's a myth. Uh, that has no biblical support whatsoever. You have to make that stuff up. And uh, men have, uh, have sold us down the river in regards to that understanding. Um, one of the things that I, I stayed away from uh, this time around in the, uh, well, I, actually, I guess I didn't do it the first time, uh, in the Second Coming series, has to do with the person of Antichrist and the teaching and all of that. Well, it's going to come up here in the Olivet Discourse, and I'm going to talk to you about that so-called personage. It really is not biblically one person, but Antichrist is a spirit, and it's many different personalities that uh, evoke and evince this Antichrist spirit and manifest itself. In fact, John is the only one in uh, in uh, first and second John that uses the phrase Antichrist, and when he uses it, he uses it talking about the docetic Gnostics that he was speaking to uh, to his uh, unknown church to us, but writing to them about these are Antichrists. And the docetic Gnostics believe that the Lord Jesus was just basically a phantom. He just seemed like he was real. Docetic Gnostics taken from dosis, which means seems like. And so John's entire push in 1 John and in 2 John really has a lot to do uh, with uh, combating this, these docetic Gnostics. And he he referred to these people that believe that Jesus did not have an earthly body, so they denied his humanity. And that's critical because if Jesus doesn't come as a true man and die on the cross as a man for Adam's, uh, Adam's mankind relative to the elect out of Adam, then we don't have a savior. Uh, there has to be, this, uh, he has to be an absolute man. But see, under docetic Gnosticism, he's not a man because he doesn't really have a body. It was just put on. It was just it seemed like he had a body. In other words, he pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. Well, of course, that's not true. But 
John refers to the people that hold to that as antichrist, as antichrist. Um, never is there a bridge between John's antichrist in 1st and 2nd John over into, say, the 12th, 13th, 14th chapter, 13th chapter in particular of Revelation, where this beast, for instance, that is referred to as the antichrist. There's no biblical bridge between 1st John and 2nd John and Revelation 13, nor is there a bridge between 1st and 2nd John or Revelation 13 on over to 2nd Thessalonians, the second chapter. This man of sin or man of lawlessness, depending upon which, uh, which kind of a Greek text you're using right there. N nowhere does it refer to these individuals as being antichrist. Um, so there is not one, that, that's all a myth, uh, that, that there's going to be supposedly this one individual that will be raised up, it's going to rule over the nations for like a period of seven years, and in the middle of the seven years, he's going to break his covenant supposedly with, uh, with uh, uh, the nation of Israel is that they've come back into the land and then he turns into this incredible monster, right? And then blood rains, runs in the streets and he's putting people to death, you know, and it's just, yeah. No, uh, the Bible doesn't teach that. That's all made up. Uh, you have nothing to fear from that kind of a thing. I, I know a lot of books get sold off of that. A lot of DVDs get sold. A lot of conferences are attended in regards to that kind of stuff. But I am just so sorry that you have wasted your time, your money, and your emotions listening to that drivel um, because it has no basis in Scripture. And I know people open up their Bibles and they say, well, it's right here, you know, but, but what they're doing to you is they are eisegeting. That means to read something into the text of Scripture, to eisegete, read into the text of Scripture, something that the Scripture does not say on its own. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous because we change the meaning of the Bible. And then, of course, nobody gets the right understanding of what Scripture is saying. And then, of course, that's a grievous sin. Yeah, Deuteronomy 4, 2, Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, Revelation 21, verses 18 and 19. Uh, all talk about the fact that we're not to add or take away from God's word. And if we do, there are consequences, not only here on earth now, but in eternity. This is, this is very, very bad, very serious uh, things to do. So that's just one aspect, you know, relative to, I, I didn't get into a lot of the Antichrist thing. It's going to come up here, uh, that idea of it anyway, throughout the Olivet uh, Discourse. So uh, what I'd like for you to do is join me in the 24th chapter of Matthew so that I can start in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. <laughs> 23rd chapter is where we actually need to start because what is happening in the 23rd chapter of Matthew is the Lord Jesus is dealing with uh, these scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, and he calls them that eight different times. And in the very last time he is addressing them, he talks about their responsibility for all the blood that had been shed from the beginning of time uh, unto the time of Zechariah. Um, the time of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who was murdered between the temple and the altar. And he says, all of that bloodletting is going to come upon this generation. We're going to get into that. We're going to show you how that, that idea of bloodletting and the temple feeds and fuels us into the beginning of the 24th chapter of Matthew, where the boys find Jesus, they chase him up on the Mount of Olives after he has left the building, so to speak, and they are just aghast that he has talked about the destruction of this temple and that this temple is going down. And this is what opens up Jesus' Olivet Discourse where he begins to tell them, here's what's going to be happening during this generation, not some far-off generation. You know now that that's not possible. You know now that these events of the Olivet Discourse course, things surrounding the second coming of Christ and the second coming in particular, as you have been with us throughout all of these installments, going through all the scripture, you know now, you are responsible now to change minds. If yours hasn't been changed yet, I don't know what to say. Quit being so darn stubborn 
and uh, quit feeding the fuel of, of your own desires. And, and that's what we have to face. Is a lot of times when people will not listen to biblical truth in regards to, the, to something like this, where it demands a change, it's because that demand comes at a very high price. Suddenly you've got to start believing something different. You've got to believe what the scripture says as opposed to what you thought the scripture says. And there's a lot of pride, you know, that's involved with that. And that all needs to die. You know, you're just lifting yourself up as a giant idol. If you're not a preterist and you're some kind of futurist, you've got idolatry running through your veins because the Bible doesn't teach it. And if you know the Bible doesn't teach it and you've been through all of this and you're responsible uh, for everything that you have heard me talk about and you still want to hold on to some still down the road future second coming of Christ, you're an idolater. You're holding up a different God, a different Jesus, and a different word of God than what is is given to you through propositional revelation of the scriptures. As I've said to you over and over, if you disagree with me, if you think I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong. It has never happened, and I don't think it ever will happen. But just before we do that, if you'd like to write to me, you can always do that by getting at me at Kelly Nelson Burks. DrKellyNelsonBurks.com, that's our website address. You can go ahead and check us out over there. You could also write to me personally at ktestifytotruth at aol.com. Get on the Twitter thing, and like I have, I guess, <laughs> and you can write me at, at Dr. Kelly Burks, at Dr. Kelly Burks. What else are we, are we writing down there at the bottom? I can't see everything. Brian, it's all in reverse to me, brother. Then there's Facebook. Yes, thank you, sir. Our, uh, our church is on Facebook. You can just punch in Messiah Reform Church. If you need to put in Omaha, I don't know if that's necessary, but we are, we are there. And come on down and like the pages. And also, by the way, if you want to review uh, some of the, uh, the teachings that we've done here, you can either catch it here on YouTube uh, under Brian D., where you've been listening to this uh, material, or you can go over to our website, drkellynelsonburks.com. We've got a couple that, that's sitting there that will kind of get you into it and get you introduced and, and this kind of a thing. So once again, uh, if you would like to correspond with me, that's how you do it. Some of you have been doing that. I have uh, uh, responded to some of your questions here uh, on this broadcast. Broadcast? I don't even know if that's the right thing to say anymore. But uh, we've responded to some of it that way and others I've kind of held back. Um, hopefully, uh, after we're done with the Olivet Discourse, we'll be able to have an installment where it's just questions and answers, a Q&A section, and Elder Brian will come up here with me, and he'll read off a bunch of the questions. We'll discuss them together and go back and forth on some of these issues that are important to you, that are important to us. So that's something you might want to be planning towards right now. You could even start to... Um, Write some of those questions out to me if you want, and I'll collect them all and, and uh, put them on the Q&A uh, broadcast that we'll have uh, right after the Olivet Discourse. Okay, is that enough commercials? That's enough commercials. 23rd chapter of Matthew. Look at the intensity of what is, what is going on right here. The scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites, he says to them. Because of all they have done, I mean, just look at it all in verse 13. You're hypocrites because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. He says in 15, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrite! You travel around on the sea and the land to make a proselyte. When he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as, your, as yourselves. Oh my gosh! <laughs> You know, Jesus has, is coming to a close in regards to his ministry to Israel and to the Jews, the Jewish leadership and the members of the Sanhedrin in particular. Now his focus is all about going to the cross and he is in control of everything that is taking place as he is on his way to the cross. He's not, he's not worried about their reaction. He's not concerned if he has offended them in any way, shape, or form. They have this information coming, and it's judgment that comes to them. He calls them blind guides who strain out at a gnat, a little gnat, but swallow a camel. It has to do with what they believed and the insidiousness and the craziness of the additional doctrines they had added to God's word. Um, and uh, he continues that telling them that they're blind Pharisees. Clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside might become clean also. He goes on like this. In verse 34, he says, Therefore, after he calls them a bunch of snakes and a brood of vipers, that they're not going to be able to escape the sentence of hell. 
It's Gehenna in Greek. It's a reference to the lake of fire. He says in 34, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets, wise men, scribes. By the way, those scribes are in reference to the apostles who are writing, who will be writing the gospels and writing the epistles. At the end of the 13th chapter of Matthew, he speaks about uh, his uh, apostles as he's talking to them. He calls them his scribes. You can see it at the end of the 13th chapter of Matthew. So here in Matthew 23, 34, he says, I'm sending you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Maybe you might want to be thinking of that idea of persecution from city to city. Matthew, the 10th chapter, and by the time we get to the 23rd verse, he's, he's got his boys out there after he is gone, and it's, it's after the book of Acts has taken place, and they're on the run. They've been ministering, they've been evangelizing, they've been starting churches, and they're being persecuted from city to city. And that's where in Matthew 10, 23, Jesus says, you, my, my boys, will not give Get through all the cities of Israel running until the Son of Man is come. So think of it in those terms. Persecuted from city to city, he's got his second coming in view here. Verse 35, so that upon all of you, meaning the scribes and the Pharisees, members of the Sanhedrin, may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth, the blood of righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. This generation. Every time Jesus uses that phrase, it's inclusive of the people who are alive at that moment in the first century as he is preaching to them. He says, this generation. It's, 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 very, easy. it's, it's very easy to determine what he means right there. Um, he never means this generation that fulfills these things. And that's made up, by the way, as if there's some generation off in the future out there that's going to fulfill. No, he talks about this. It's very a co-determined. It's very easy to follow. This genia, the Greek word. There's two different uh, Greek words that can be translated generation in the Greek New Testament. One is genos, and it has to do with, uh, it could have to do with a, a family, a tribe, um, a people group, that kind of a thing. Genos never has the idea, however, of one particular uh, definition uh, that is found under the Greek word genia. Genia. And Genia has the additional component of a definition of contemporary, or in the plural, contemporaries. And Jesus only uses the Greek word Genia in all the gospel accounts. That's how the writers present him. Not using Genos, but Genia. So when he says here, like in 36 of chapter 23, all these things will come upon this generation, this Genia, these, this, my contemporaries. My contemporaries, this, contemporaries. He means those who are alive at the same time that he is. Language, language does not adjust itself relative to definition. That's why we have lexicons. That's why you can look words up. That's why we pay attention to context, how the word is being used in a context, who is being addressed, you know, and how they're being addressed. Grammar is very important. And then he says to them in verse 37, he begins to expand now what he's saying to them in regards to this cursing, and he brings the city of Jerusalem into all of this, because he knows what's coming, right? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Now watch. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Now, the your house, the your, is a reference back grammatically to the top of 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So it's the house that is in Jerusalem. So it's not the house of Israel, not the house of Judah, not the northern kingdom. No, it's the house that is in Jerusalem. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For, 39, I say to you, from now on, you will not see me. 
Jerusalem, right? Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that just got through taking place a little bit earlier as Jesus came down on the so-called triumphal entry on the Mount of Olives, riding on the fold of a donkey, and the people were uh, putting down palm leaves and, and spreading out their clothes, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now, save now. It's all out of Psalm 118. Psalm 118 was, was uh, sung and used a lot. Uh, during the Passover celebration. And so as they began to, to see him, they were saying, save now, save now. That's in Psalm 118. Uh, at the end of Psalm 118, it speaks about, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the people were saying that. They knew that Jesus, the Messiah, had come in the authority of Yahweh's name. Yahweh's name, the name of the Lord. So he comes with that authority. Now these people on the Mount of Olives, they're very fickle, but just a few days later, same group of people during the Passover time are going to be uh, standing in front of Pilate, great crowd of people there because of Passover, and they're going to say to him, crucify him, crucify him, speaking to Jesus. And Pilate's going to say, why, finally? What has he done? He hasn't done anything wrong. And, and, and they, say to him, they say to Pilate, the mass of people, Jerusalem people, say, let his blood be on us and on our children. And of course, that's the death knell right there. And that's what will in fact take place in less than um, 40 years from that moment, as a matter of fact, once that transpires. And so Jesus then turns and says, you will not see me. In other words, you will not see or understand who I am until you acknowledge that this is about me. Blessed is he, me, Jesus says, who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he turns on his heel and he leaves the temple. Very dramatic. Jesus has been filled with burning passion as he's gone through this 23rd chapter, speaking directly to the Jewish leadership of that time. And at the very end, talks about the city of Jerusalem, how that they had refused him. And that Jerusalem's house, meaning the temple, would be left desolate, would be left desolate. Jesus had not spoken publicly in this manner before. And the disciples are standing there, of course, and they're aghast. It's like jaws drop, mouths are open that Jesus has said this. And that's, that's the attitude, that's the feel you've got to have as you move into the 24th chapter and verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to him to point out the temple buildings to him. I, I tell uh, my congregation here one of the best ways to recognize what is happening here in regards to the word house in chapter 23 verse 38 and temple here in 24 1 is to take your pencil and go from uh, the 38th verse of the 23rd chapter, behold your house, go from the word house all the way down to 24 1 where it says temple and make that connection right there. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Now that's an important feature right there. Why did they do that? Why? Because what, what we've got here is Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. We've got these four disciples in particular that are following Jesus out. We don't know what the other, the other guys are doing. We don't know about the other eight. Uh, but four of them have followed Jesus out. And they're going to end up on the side, somewhere on the side, of uh, the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple precinct where Jesus is going to give this prophecy that would be fulfilled in less than a generation. A biblical generation was approximately 40 years and this was going to be fulfilled during that time. And so as, as Jesus is leaving the area, they want him to turn around and look at this temple. When they say to him, they come up, point out the buildings of the temple and, and Jesus says to them in verse 2, he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And that lines up right with 2338. 2338. Behold, your house is being left to you, what? Desolate, right? Desolate. Not one stone will be left standing. And the boys are turning to Jesus, and they want him to see the magnificence of this. I mean, basically... 
It was still under construction uh, within a couple of years before AD 66 and the so-called war with Rome started. It wasn't much of a war. It was pretty much one-sided, although, um, uh, although the Jews did have some, some skirmish victories at the beginning of the war, and Zechariah prophesied about that uh, starting in Zechariah 12. Very fascinating. But in any case, um, Jesus says these things are going to happen. The boys are just overwhelmed with this temple like all the Jews were. I mean, it was the dumb diamond of the Mediterranean. It was said that for miles and miles all around, you could look anywhere within miles and miles around the vicinity of Jerusalem, and at any time you could see like a just a glimmering shining diamond, the sun just striking the outer facades of, of this temple. The white marble, the silver, the gold, a filigree, thick, thick amounts of gold all the way around the temple going up the side of it. And we're talking about just the area of the holy place and then the holy of holies, that building that contained that. And then the temple proper all the way around contained many areas, uh, many courts, um, many alcoves, many rooms, many amphitheaters and auditoriums. I mean, this was a real place of teaching, a place of meeting. The Sanhedrin met there. Uh, and uh, uh, this was the, the crowning achievement. And at this time in history, um, Jerusalem was becoming a real economic powerhouse in that, in that time and in that area. As a matter of fact, in the 17th and 18th chapter of Revelation, which basically records the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, it's the whole war from 66 to 70, but in, after the temple has been blown away, uh, chapter 17 and 18, you've got... Um, the men, the merchants, the businessmen of the world pounding their chests and lamenting that Jerusalem is destroyed and all of their monies and all of their goods and all of their future profits, prospects were destroyed with it because Jerusalem was a, the Jews were a financial powerhouse at that time. And this is one of the reasons why Rome took so long in finally not taking any more of the Jews' baloney, we'll call it for now, uh, and their resistance to Rome and waited so long to finally go to war and attack them and shut them down. And it ended up being a, a, a Roman Empire worldwide series of pogroms that took place uh, against the Jews from A.D. 66 all the way up uh, 270. But they, well, the boys are leaving the temple after Jesus has said this and they can't believe he said this. Who would do this? Why would somebody do this? How is, is, uh, would they do it? Is, it? is being implied. How could they do this? I mean, look at this thing. Talk about built to last, right? And the, see, this was the idol of Judaism. The temple was the idol of Judaism. And John really brings this out in the book of Revelation. Speaks about Jerusalem as the great whore. That's right. It's not New York City. It's not some rebuilt Babylon. It's not. The text is self interpreting. In Revelation, the eighth, uh, 11th uh, chapter and the 8th verse talks about the fact that. Uh, that this was this great city it talked about uh, that was compared to Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. Well, where was our Lord crucified? Well, Jerusalem, that's easy. Revelation 11 and verse 8, and it speaks about it being that great city among all the other cities of the world. You take that phrase and you follow it, that great city from chapter 11 all the way through chapter 18, and you will find that that great city is in reference to the great whore, is in reference to the city of Jerusalem, excuse me, and its occupants in particular. Very strong, strong language that's being used right here. And I'll tell you, the book of Revelation is, is not for the squeamish. Evidently, it's not for people who have hiccups either. Shouldn't have hiccups when you're trying to teach, right? No, that's not a good thing. But the book of Revelation uses some pretty darn strong language to describe the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, two times during the seven letters in chapters 2 and 3, chapters 2 through 3 of Revelation. He refers to uh, that, uh, the synag that a couple of the cities contained a synagogue of Satan, a synagogue of Satan. That's what the Lord Jesus thought of these synagogues uh, that were held by these Jews, these ethnic Jews, and what went on there and how they had denied him and that, that they're basically satanic, that their very existence since Christ has come and has fulfilled all that was written about him, Luke 
2444, in the Law of the Prophets and the Psalms, that he came, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, and until heaven and earth pass away, that's a reference to the law and to the temple where the law was carried out. I've already showed you all this, right? So you, you know all this, that not one jot or tittle of the law will pass until it's all fulfilled. Well, that's why Luke 24, 44 is important. Jesus says he has come and he has fulfilled all of that. And so what you've got then is you've got a generation's worth from uh, approximately A.D. 30, from the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension forward, you have this entire community still continuing to ignore the fulfillment of all the entire Mosaic system and the need for slitting animal throats and blood and sacrifice and feast days are done. Christ has fulfilled them. And during that period, that approximately 40-year uh, period, which we call a transition period from about AD 30 to AD 70, these things are being understood and the writers of the New Testament are talking about that. And they're talking about how they were fulfilled and now they are going away. Little bit by little bit by little bit, they cease to be practiced. But the traditional Jews there in Jerusalem and throughout the Roman Empire, they kept coming back three times a year in particular, mandatory feast, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles were being attended by the Jewish males up to a certain age and throughout the entire Roman Empire, coming back and they're killing animals and they're slitting throats, you know, and all that kind of a thing. And, and it's a grief, it's a grieving, an absolute grieving thing that is going on here according to the New Testament documents. Jesus says, not one stone, chapter 24 and verse 2, not one stone will be left upon another. You know, there's a lot to be said when at the top of verse 2 he says to them, do you not see all these things? Think about that for a second. What he's, what he's saying to them is, are, are you not paying attention? Do you not really see all these things? In other words, do you not see and understand it, this temple, for what it is and what it represents? It's an affront to me. It's an affront to my father, Jesus is implying. It's in front, an affront to the Godhead, what these people have done with it and what they're doing to you and to the people of Jerusalem and Judea in particular at that time in history. That's why he says at the bottom of verse 2, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And that was fulfilled literally and absolutely. Um, Josephus talks about this as well as Tacitus, the Roman historian, that after the temple was burned down about August of A.D. 70, after things cooled down a little bit more, uh, the Romans in, brought in their various machines, machinery, and they began prying up these huge stones uh, that were in the courtyard area around the temple and around the entire temple mount because when the temple burned down all all of the gold that was on the outside melted and went down into the crevices, down below, past the stones. And so these guys, that was part of their loot. You know, they could take that stuff and all that gold. I mean, you talk about being made a millionaire like that. You know, and retirement from the Roman uh, army was not, you know, they didn't have great retirement plan, plan or anything like that. You had to make your own retirement plan, and this is how they went about doing that. So not one stone would be left upon another till all would be torn down, thrown down. That included that action as well. And so we have that factually, and I mean, a secular history points that out that the, not one stone was left upon another. Jesus was vindicated in regards to what he said right here. How come we don't ever hear about that? I mean, you look at the History Channel, and they've got stories about the overthrow of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and so on and so forth. And they don't point out the fact that Jesus, maybe some of them do, but I don't want to be unkind here, but I mean, let's hear more of it. Let's hear more of that stuff. As opposed to the nonsense that these people got on there with their people with degrees coming out their gray matter coming out of their ear. You know, can't tell where their last name stops and their degree letters begin or something like that. I got degrees. Anybody, anybody can go get a degree. It's what you do with it that matters. And so Jesus says this to the boys and he starts making his way up the Mount of Olives. Verse 3 of chapter 24. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So he had made it before them, ahead of them, and he's sitting. 
no doubt sitting looking o out over that uh, that uh, western view of the uh, of the temple right there and the boys start gathering around him mark 13 says it's peter it's james it's john and it's andrew we've got the four of them that are sitting here right now and it's private it says private they wanted a private talk with him and what they're about to ask him, they're not fighting with him over this. Like, we're not fighting with you over whether this temple can be destroyed. They're basically believing what he says because they've come to a conclusion. You can see it in their, in their question right now. And verse 3 contains very important two questions, middle of three. And so they say to Jesus, tell us when, you should mark that, when will these things happen and what, mark that, will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. The sign of your coming and the end of the age. So tell us, when will these things happen? Well, these things is in reference to the destruction of the house. These things are in reference to the destruction of the temple and the things of these buildings being thrown down. Bottom of verse 2, not one stone to be left upon another that will not be torn down. So they ask him, when will these things happen? Now, he's going to say that there's at, at one point during the Olivet Discourse that, that no man will know the day or the hour of his coming and when these things will be. No man knows the day of the hour. Um, only the Father will know that. But as Jesus is talking on the earth and he's in submission to the Father and only speaks those things that the Father reveals to him, Jesus does not reveal this because it's not being revealed to him right then. Well, that's okay. That's okay. So even though it says you can't know the day or the hour, that means you can't know the calendared day from this perspective until it happens. You can't know the calendar day or the hour. You can't know the, the hour of that calendar day, that time on the clock. But you, he spends all of the, of the first half of the 24th chapter of Matthew speaking about signs and things that will point to this end coming to pass. You will be able to see it and he's going to liken it to various things like a fig tree and how that you know that when the fig tree begins to blossom, summer is near, so it will be when all of these things begin to happen that these things that I'm telling you are going to take place are near even at the door, you see. And we're going to want to watch out for something as we go through the 24th chapter here, there's a, a little thing that, that Matthew uses that really is helpful for uh, helping us place a timing determiner as to when these things, these events in Matthew 24 would take place because he addresses it to the four disciples that are with him and he's constantly using the second person plural pronoun. He's constantly using it towards the boys saying that you all would see this. You all would experience that. It's the second person plural pronoun in various forms right here and I'll try to uh, I'll try to mark that for you as we are going. So, middle of three, tell us when these things will happen. And that's why he goes through the signs. He says that you can't know the day or the hour, but you can know the approximate timing of these things. And then second question, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And I will show you, he's already opened that up. He's already talked about the fact that his coming is directly tied into the destruction of the temple. He's already said in 2338, your house is being left to you desolate. He's already said in 24, verse 2, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Let me give you a little preview. Go to verse 29. Verse 29 of Matthew 24, helping to answer what will be the sign of your coming. And by the way, coming there is parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence, and the end of the age. We'll talk about that term in just a minute here. But in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, now think back on your, your previous installments and your previous lessons. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the side sky sun moon stars so you know from genesis 37 verses 9 through 10 
that that very first occurrence of that is in reference to the nation of Israel. In other words, those who are left of Israel at that time in history, when it talks about their sun, moon, and stars falling, it means that their nation is falling. So, so the nation will fall, he says. And then at the end of verse 29, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I'll give you a little more detail on that when we get to it in our verse by verse. But that has to do, that phrase, it's another Jewish phrase. Powers of the heavens has to do with Jewish government coming down. And then, verse 30 says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven. Now, if you have a New American Standard, it says sky right there. Disagree with that. I disagree with that. It's urano, and sometimes it can be translated as sky. But I will suggest to you that in the context here, uh, the correct translation of urano would be heaven. So, and I'll show you why right now. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. So there is a sign of the Son of Man, and the sign of the Son of Man himself is in heaven. He's in heaven. And when he talks about himself coming, it's in light of the fact that the temple is coming down. When the temple is destroyed, that is the sign of his coming, because that's what he opened up the chapter with. He actually ended the 23rd chapter with that clue, and he opens the 24th chapter in the second verse uh, with that as well. So when, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the Gi, is the Greek word, uh, it can be translated earth or it can be translated land. The context demands land, I believe. So then when that happens, all the tribes of the land will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now I know people say, well, wait a minute, right there, Burks, it says that they will see the Son of Man. All right, hang on. Don't miss this. At the middle, uh, middle of verse 30, after he, the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven, then all the tribes of the land will mourn. Now that's a direct tie-in with Revelation 1-7. You should look at it. Revelation 1-7. This is how John opens up the book of Revelation. Revelation 1-7. And he says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even, that's chi, that's an explanative conjunction in Greek, chi, translated as even here. Every eye will see him, chi, even, or that is, those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the Gi land will mourn because of him. So the every eye that sees him is defined as even, chi, that is, those who pierced him. So those who had a hand in killing him, in piercing him, uh, the Jewish leadership, members of the Sanhedrin, those of Roman soldiery, the centurion, for instance, that was overseeing all of that, th uh, he's, giving you, uh, he's giving you a time reference here that, that they would be alive when this happened. Again, that brings it down to this generation, this genia, these my contemporaries, see? And so he's coming with clouds. Every eye will see him. Who is the every eye? It's not about giant trinitrons in stadiums and, you know, showing the second coming happening, you know, all over the earth through, you know, satellite TV. God, you got to really work hard for this nonsense, don't you? I mean, that's just... I gave you full marks, you know, for inventiveness, by the way. Uh, every eye will see him. That is, those who pierced him. Those who pierced him are the every eye that sees him. That's your context right here. And who else will see him? All the tribes of the land will mourn. That means there has to be tribes to a greater or lesser degree, and not all 12 of them were there on the land, by the way. That's not possible biblically or historically. But there were some from the tribes. There may have been a, a mixture of maybe five, maybe six, something like that. But not all the tribes. But some of them were there, the tribes of the land. Again, it's a reference to the time when the Jews were in control of that entire area of uh, Palestine and or the promised land, the area of Judea there in the first century. They're the ones who would see and mourn, etc., etc. So that's what John is referring to there. You go back to Matthew 24. 
and verse 30. He gets that repeat going here. The sign of the Son of Man appears in the heaven. Then all the tribes of the land will mourn. Now let's keep going. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, New American Standard. It's to Uranu, the heaven of the heaven, coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and great glory. Well, what they see uh, coming, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, what they're seeing is, top of 30, the sign of the Son of Man that appears in heaven. By the way, there's no definite article there. Top of verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man that appears in Urano, heaven. How does that come out? Well, he says, and he quotes now out of the Old Testament, various places we could look at. Daniel 7.13 is one really good one. They'll see the Son of Man coming uh, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, that's an Old Testament. Remember we went through some of this already? Old Testament metaphor. Only God comes on the clouds. Remember this? Only God comes on the clouds. So when it says the Son of Man comes on the clouds, it's referring to his divinity. God is coming. It's the Son of Man who's being vindicated. The Son of Man being the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what he is going to say to the members of the Sanhedrin in chapter 26 and verse 64. Chapter 26 and verse 64, when he's standing before the high priest Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says to him, I adjure you by the living God. You tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus says to him, you have said it. In other words, yes, I am. That's Jewish courtesy speech stated in that way. You have said it. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, all of you, second person plural pronoun, all of you, speaking to the members of the Sanhedrin that were there, will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. So two things we can get from this. Number one, he speaks another audience relevancy uh, statement right here. That these individuals, or at least the majority of them, at, at, during that generation, his contemporaries, would experience his coming. They would see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. When he speaks about sitting at the right hand of power, more Jewish uh, slang speech is going on here. Especially Psalm 110, you know, uh, the most oft-repeated psalm messianically about Christ, probably in the New Testament. Yehoah said to my Adonai, so Yehoah said to my Adonai, my Lord, meaning Jesus is the Adonai, so Father is speaking to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your seat. Rule in the midst of your enemies. And that's repeated constantly uh, throughout the uh, Gospels, several times in the book of Hebrews, another thing for another time. But when Jesus says this, he is claiming equality with God the Father. He's claiming divinity. He's claiming ontological similarity, ontological being. His being is similar to the Father. He got in trouble with this once before uh, in, uh, in John 5 and verse uh, 18, calling God his Father, making himself equal with God. Isos for equal. Same as. Same as. And so he says, you'll see the sentiment coming at the right hand of power. Coming on the clouds of heaven, look at what the high priest's response is. It says, the high priest tore his robes and said he has blasphemed. Well, it's not blasphemy to say you'll see me coming. It's blasphemy to say you'll see me coming in clouds, because only God comes with the clouds. Isaiah, the 19th chapter, and a number of other places. We'll look at them later. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. See, Jesus is in control of this entire trial situation that's going on right here. All of their, all of their terrible so-called false witnesses, none of them agreed up together on what they had heard him say. Nothing was And so according to Deuteronomy uh, uh, you know, 17 and 19, they should have all been put to death, as a matter of fact, for lying and bearing false witness like they, they did. But, of course, they were all being paid and hired out. So you got this going on right here. So when Jesus says in Matthew 24, 
and the bottom of verse 30, that they would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's what that is in reference to. He is referring to Daniel 7 and verse 13, saying that he is going to fulfill that. It's Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. We should look at it. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Notice the similarities here. In Daniel 7, 13, it says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. That's Matthew 24, 30. No if, ands, or but about it. And so when Jesus is saying this to the boys, that they would see him, the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory, what he's saying to them is, I will be right then fulfilling Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Because let's look at what's going to happen next in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Behold, comes with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, Glory, a kingdom that all peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So the kingdom is handed to him. Slip over to Revelation. Hold your spot in Matthew. Slip over to Revelation and the 11th chapter. And one of the things you have to understand about the book of Revelation is that the, the, the last three and a half years of the... Uh, 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 Flipsas Megas, the Great Tribulation, uh, from AD 66 to 70, that it's all encapsulated from Revelation chapter 4 through chapter 11. And then we have an interlude that goes on from chapters 12, 13, and 14. A little bit of 15, but from 15 and then 16 on, what we have is another view of the same three and a half years relative to the destruction. So look at what happens in the first view, the first half of the book of Revelation. Look at what happens as a result of Christ returning as a result of the last trumpet or the seventh trumpet that is blown. In chapter 11 and verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven. What, what are these loud voices saying? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever. What did we just get through reading in Daniel 7, 14? That a kingdom was given to him, a dominion which will never pass away. Now, Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He will reign forever. Two or four elders sit on the thrones before God, fell down on their faces, worship. We give you thanks, O Lord, the Almighty, who are, who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And then the first thing he does with his reign is he begins to judge the nations. Verse 18 here of Revelation 11, Revelation 11, 18, this is Matthew 25. This is sheep and the goat judgment. Look at 18. And the nations were enraged. Well, that fulfills Psalm 2. And your wrath has come, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the gi, the land. Say. Matthew 24, now verse 31. After the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven, the sign of the Son of Man is in heaven. The Son of Man is where? He's in heaven. <laughs> his, his parousia occurs when the temple goes down. And then he quotes that they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Daniel 7.13. And then what happens next? 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. I'm not going to get into a, a big deal right, right now, because all I'm trying to show you here is the fulfillment of the destruction of the temple coincides with Christ's second coming. Well, with that second coming, he sends forth his angels with a great trumpet. They gather together his elect. They episunagoge, that's what it means to gather together. Episunagoge, they intensely synagogue together his elect. They do it from one end, it says, from the four winds, from one end of heaven, not sky, it's Uranu, from one end of heaven to the other. And I'm not going to do it now, but I, I believe that what this is pointing at is that he takes all of his elect, trans time, 
He blasts past time. Now we're in the eternal now of God. And he gathers them all unto himself at that moment. Even though you hadn't been born yet, even though I hadn't been born yet, he already determined that it would take place and he would make it happen, you see. And, and that happened at that moment. This is a direct reference to 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. This is the harpazo right here that Paul talks about. Don't go there. Just make a note of it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 uh, through 17. And he gathers them together from one end of the sky to the other. You say, how could that happen? Well, it happens in the eternal now of God. Now I'm going to show you this. Ecclesiastes 3. With me? Ecclesiastes 3. And uh, we're going to give us some context here. Uh, verse 14 into 15. Ready? The writer, probably Solomon, says, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it. There is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. Nothing to add to it. Nothing to take from it. It's perfect. Everything God does. Now watch, 15. That which is has already been. And that which will be has already been. For God seeks what has passed by. Now that's New American Standard. Listen to it in the New English Bible. I think the New English Bible really has the best English translation of this according to the Hebrew. Quote, whatever is has been already. And whatever is to come has been already. And God summons each event back in its turn. In other words, verse 14, he does everything so perfectly. Nothing gets added to it. Nothing gets taken away from it. Including that which has not yet taken place. That which is has already been. Where? In the heart and mind of God. In the eternal now of God and in his presence. In the calendarless, non-time dominated realm of God. Where he is not bound to time. He makes this happen. And I believe this text, which I'll return to again at a later time, this text right here has everything to do with what is happening in Matthew 24 and verse 31. Look back at it. Matthew 24, verse 31. With this great trumpet, which by the way is the last trumpet, and they, these angels, episunogoge, his elect, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Time, uh, time in the heavenly realm, God, angels, and their activities, they are not bound to the tick-tock of the clock. They're not bound to it. And so God brings all of his unto himself. And the Bema Seat rewards take place. What do we just read in Revelation 11, verses 15 through 18? And the time had come. Once the, he comes back and he, the kingdom is established and Daniel 7, 13 is fulfilled and he comes back and it's time for the nations to be judged. And he judges them and then he rewards his prophets and those who are faithful to him. The rewarding is the Bema Seed judgment for works done in faithfulness. That'll be for all of his believers throughout time, you see. And then there are the nations um, that uh, are being destroyed. And these are, the, these are the goats of the sheep and the goat uh, judgment activity. And this already happened. It happened in AD 70 when time all around just collapses like it does in God's eternal now. Time collapses and that which has been will be again and that which has been once before will transcribe itself again and God summons the past events to himself he summons the past to himself as well as as the future Psalm 90 in verse 4 talks about this don't go there write it down if you go there you won't be where I need you to be to follow along with what I'm doing right here. I'm going to come back to this subject, I promise, because it, it, it did this, uh, a verse like this demands that we deal with this, with this subject of chronotology.
see? Because people want to know, okay, Jesus came back in 8070. It's real clear that that's what the Bible teaches. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Well, hallelujah, finally. Good. I'm so glad. Now you just need to move to Omaha, okay? Because this is the only place you're going to be able to go to church. I know I've wrecked you now, see? I've wrecked you. People can't go anywhere. To, once I get them into this church, I lock them in because they can't go anywhere else. <laughs> I got people in here chained. <laughs> Mary's like, let me go, let me go. <laughs> she kind of cute. She kind of cute. All right. Back to the beginning of 24. I'll give it a little bit more time here, a little bit more. We're at verse 3. See, this is what I, this is, you see now why we had to go through all the rest of that stuff. All those previous installments, right, in order to start working through this. And I'm just touching on some of these things that we've already been over. And if there's anything you're, you're still unclear about, go back through these installments. Brian has got it all laid out really nice here for you. You can just plunk your way uh, right on, uh, right on to, uh, to any installment uh, that you want to go back to. And they're all titled. You know, so if you need to review the heavens and earth, there's two installments on that. If you need to review the latter days, there's two installments on that. And it says so. Okay. And so the boy is sitting with Jesus on the Mount of Olives in verse 3. And they say, tell us when will these things happen. And that's what he's going to do in the first half of Matthew 24. And then what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So that's why I took you back to verses 29 and 30 and 31. So we can talk about the sign of his coming. The sign of his coming, the sign is the sign is the son of man who is in heaven. The sign is, is the son of man who is in heaven. The earthly sign is the destruction of the temple. And when that happens, Daniel 7.13 kicks in, and so he quotes that when he says in, in, uh, in verse uh, 30 that they will see, the tribes of the, of the land will mourn, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great, great glory. In other words, the power and great glory is in reference to verse 29, where sun, moon, and stars and the powers of the heaven shaken and fall down. The, the announcement of the failing of Israel... Uh, religiously, economically, politically, was AD 70, August of AD 70, when that whole thing went down, when the temple was burned to the ground. And you have to understand, you, you read Josephus to find out a lot of this stuff, and he was an eyewitness to these things. There were different factions, different Jewish factions, groups, that were inside of Jerusalem for that three and a half year period, because Rome had them surrounded. They couldn't get out. They were starving them in there, and they were eating their children. Deuteronomy 28 prophesies that this would happen. Josephus talks about them doing this. They were eating their children. There was cannibalism going on in there. Uh, groups of them trying to take over, fighting for control over the temple, and in the holy place in particular. Talks about the fact that there was blood running freely throughout the holy place. In the temple. I mean, they were killing themselves off. It was probably an act of mercy that that temple even got lit on fire in the first place. And, you know, it depends upon who you're reading. We just don't have uh, an absolute as to who started that fire. You know, some people will say that a Roman soldier just was close in and had those last few people pinned in to the Temple Mount area and they started lobbing, um, you know, uh, firebrands and that kind of a thing over the wall. Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's possible, it's possible that the Jews themselves got that thing fired up. You know, Masada was only, is only a few short years away off into the future, future at AD 135 at the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt. You know, they had to try one more time. And they get all the way up onto Masada, which was uh, Herod's, uh, you know, summer vacation joint. And, uh, the Romans surrounded that, and they had no choice. And you know what the Jews did up there? You know, they committed suicide, mass suicide. It's crazy. It was demoniz demonization. We're learning about that as we, uh, here in uh, January of 2014, we're studying the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings here at Messiah, and we're, we're noticing the places where God is, is talking about how he is judging these people in Jerusalem because one of the things that he's judging them over has to do with their worship of demons. There was demonization that was going on. 
there in Jerusalem. And no wonder there was. I mean, it was just like the crazy insanity that was taking place in regards to that. And so he says, back to chapter 24, verse 3 now, after he says, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming? Okay, that's taken care of now. And then he says, this is probably as far as we're going to get tonight, and of the end of the age, what is the sign of your coming? And implied, what is the sign of the end of the age? Now, um, centuliast to eon is the Greek phrase translated end of the age. Centulias to eon. Um, Centulias really means completion of a thing. A centulias, uh, soon, together. Telia, from telia, uh, the end of a thing, the completing of a thing, the perfecting of a thing. Um, together, it's all completed. The completion of the age. I, I think that's the better translation. And so the boys, they knew about this. They knew about what the centulia to eonos was. What was the completion of the age? They recognized by their question that with the destruction of the temple, the sign of his coming, and the destruction of the temple, that mean, meant the end of the age. Now, we've covered this already to a certain degree. Now let me bring you back, bring you back to it. This has everything to do with the last days. Jewish understanding of the last Last days meant one thing and one thing only that Messiah was coming and that these are the last days of Mosaic law keeping and the Mosaic stricture concerning the temple and worship and all that had to do that because they believe when Messiah came that that would all end and they got that right but it didn't happen the way they wanted it to happen and they didn't want Jesus doing it in particular because that brought an end you know these Jews were not godly men these Jewish le leaders uh, at that time they didn't want to lose out on their power, on their hold on the people, the money, and all that came along with that. They really did not want any Messiah, including the legitimate Messiah, to come along, you see. And so when the, you hear the phrase completion of the ages, it tags right along with a phrase like latter days, latter times, um, the last hour that John uses in 1 John 2, uh, 18, I believe it is. Centulio uh, to eonos. Now, now, the boys had heard Jesus talk about this phrase before. When will be the sign of your parousia and the completion of the age? So they understand that the completion of the age took place and was coterminous with the parousia, right? So, slip back to the 13th chapter of, of Matthew. We'll probably just end with this tonight. We'll pick up again so you can see, you know, why this is going to take a little bit of time and why I needed to... Uh, to get you ready for this. Can you imagine if I tried to do this, the, the Olivet Discourse for you guys, without any prep whatsoever, without getting any of these things settled in our minds, you know, so you have a, a handle on all of this, and all of a sudden I'm just telling you, well, this all happened in AD 70, and it's like, what? What are you talking about? Blah, 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 blah. But now you know better. <laughs> so the boys understood the phrase completion of the age because Jesus had taught it once before, at least once before that we're aware of here, and it happens to show up in Matthew, the 13th chapter, and specifically verse 39, Matthew 13, 39, Jesus has just given the parable of the tares, and now he's with his disciples privately, and uh, they are asking him in 36, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. So he does so in 37, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Well, who's that? Well, that's the Lord Jesus, okay? And the field is the world. As for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, God's elect people. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. It's all non-elect people, simple enough. And the enemy who sowed them, 39, uh, is the devil. And the harvest is the what? End of the age. Ah, end of the age. Suntelea. Toeonos, exact same phrase that we just saw the boys use in Matthew 24, verse 3, when they asked Jesus, when will be the, what will be the sign of your parousia and the end of the age, or the completion of the age? And so they knew that there was a hook between them. So the end of the age is directly tagged and, and roped to, chained to, uh, his parousia. We got that, right? Okay. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the completion of the age. The reapers are the angels. 40. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, 
So it shall be at the completion of the age. You could also write in there, so it will be at the time of the parousia. Right? Because the boys understood in Matthew 24, 3, that the parousia and the completion of the age were the same time. They were happening simultaneously. And so the completion of the age has to happen with the parousia. So it shall be at the end of the age. By the way, notice the phraseology here in verse 40. Just says the tares, these are the sons of the evil one. These are the non-elect. What's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to be gathered up and burned with fire. Mm. So shall it be at the completion of the age. And then he says, the Son of Man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. I think this happens simultaneously with... Uh, Matthew 24 and verse 31, we, we just read that. And he talks about how that the angels are sent forth after he comes back. And they, uh, they uh, excuse me, epi sunogoge, I'm drying out here. Epi sunogoge, his church, his elect together from the four winds of heaven, one end of heaven to the, to the other. And, and it's that realm of the eternal now of God. He gathers them. Well, I think this happens at the same time right here that he gathers 41. His angels gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, those who commit lawlessness. These are the sons of the evil one. Throw them into a furnace of fire into the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, this is not the first place Jesus has used that weeping and gnashing of teeth terminology. He's done it in Matthew 8 as well. Uh, uh, when they are thrown into the lake of fire. That's Revelation 20, uh, uh, verse 14. Really, verses 11 through 14 gives that or 15, gives that entire scenario. Then what happens? Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. See, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether you and I understand how that happens. What matters is that we believe that it does happen. So once the parousia takes place and the judgment takes place, and it's the completion of the age, and the completion of the age is coterminous with the parousia, and this judgment happens, right? What happens from A.D. 70 forward is verse 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. This is so Daniel 12 and verse 3. So much Daniel 12 and verse 3 right there. All right, go down a little bit further now. Let's go to a second parable where he uses the phrase, Suntelliato eonos. Now the parable of the dragnet, verse 47. See it? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea, gathered fish of every kind. When it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, sat down, gathered the good fish into the containers, but the bad they threw away. This is almost self-interpreting, right? I wonder who the good fish are, and I wonder who the bad fish are. <clears throat> so it will be at the completion of the age. Okay? The, in other words, the parousia, Yes. Matthew 24, 3. So it will be at the completion of the age. The angels will come forth, take out the wicked from among the righteous, throw them into a furnace of fire. In, that's, the, that's the lake of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? I think this is funny. They said to him, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. My opinion, I think they're just going, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I mean, if you read through the Gospels, you could see the boys going, there's a lot of this going on. There's a lot of that happening uh, uh, by the uh, disciples uh, and Jesus. Uh, in any case, oh, by the way, here's that passage where Jesus refers to his boys as scribes. Verse 51, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And, 53, and Jesus said to them, therefore, in other words, if you have understood all these things, who was he talking to? The 12, right? Okay. So, therefore, if you have understood the 12, you've understood these things, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household, brings out of his treasure things new and old. That's where Jesus refers to the 12 as his scribes. Scribes, scribes copied scripture. That's what scribes did. So we've already seen it in Matthew, at the end of Matthew 23, where Jesus says to the uh, scribes and Pharisees, the wicked ones, he says, I'm going to send you prophets. I'm going to send you scribes. Right? He's going to send them those who are going to do the writing of uh, the New Testament, the New Covenant. 
the, the ones who will write down the Gospels, the ones who, will write, ones who will write down the Epistles, so on and so forth. But anyway, that's a side issue. I want you to just catch, you know, the, here's where the boys caught that phrase, Sundelio Doionos, the completion of the age. And so, you know, they ask him about that. Now, we're not done with that phrase yet. I want you to go with me to Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, and look at verse 26 with me. Hebrews 9 and verse 26. This is an off used phrase and those who used it believed that they were living in it. They would believe that they were right at the end of the completion of the age centulios to eonos. Now Hebrews 9.26, speaking of Jesus who gave his own blood uh, on the cross 26, otherwise he, Christ, would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world but now what do you think the now is referring to? Right then when he's writing, right? But now, once, not twice, once, at the consummation of the ages. See, that's centulia theonos. Completion or consummation works good too. Completion or consummation of the ages. What happened? He, Christ, has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. All right, that's a timing verse right there. That tells us that the completion of the ages, the consummation of the ages, happened when Christ died. That means it was going on during the transition period from AD 30 to AD 70. Things were being wrapped up. The Mosaic standard, Mosaic law keeping, all that being wrapped up. What do you think the conversation was about in Acts 15 when Paul and Barnabas, uh, along with some you know, Judaizers, had to go to the Jerusalem Council or the Jerusalem Presbytery to get to start dealing with this whole area of are we going to teach the Gentiles the laws of Moses? Really? Are we going to do that? And of course they came to the decision, no, da, 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 da. we're not going to do that. Peter was great at that meeting, by the way. Why would you put upon the Gentiles, you know, a yoke that neither we nor our fathers could bear? See, that's not good news. That's not the gospel. That's transition period stuff. See, that's the completion of the ages going on right there. Isn't that neat? Okay, so we already have a dated time right there. Where? Let me give you one more. First Corinthians. Then I got to stop. You may want to keep going, but I'm tired. 1 Corinthians 10th chapter and verse 11. Paul understood this. Paul understood this, that they were living during the completion or the end of the age. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, speaking to the Corinthians, in the first century, yes, in the same generation Jesus ministered to, now these ex things happen to them as an example, speaking about Israel in the wilderness and the various judgments that came upon them, happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom, grammatically the upon whom goes back to who? Our, our instruction, O-U-R, upon whom the ends of the ages have arrived. Wow. Ends of the ages have arrived. Katantano. Uh, perfect tense verb form. They have arrived. My New American Standard says ends of the ages have come. But katantao would be better if it was translated as has arrived. Completed action. Has arrived. And Paul, Paul saying this to them. This is it. This is the end of the age. So then when we look at Matthew 24 and verse 3. And the boy say to him, what will be the sign of your coming? Your parousia. And the suntulio teonos, the end or the completion of the age, he begins to list everything that would be happening. And, and we've already seen now, you know, in Matthew 13, we've seen it in Hebrews 9.26, and now here in 1 Corinthians 10.11, that the completion of the age or the end of the age was right then. It's not off 2,000 years in the future. See? It can't be. It's contradictory to Scripture for it to be that way. Why are we hitting this so hard? Why is this, this preterist understanding of Scripture, which was Jesus and the Apostles' understanding of, of Scripture, eschatology, and prophecy, why is this so important? Because if you don't believe it, you'll never live like it's true. And you keep waiting for something to happen that's never going to happen. 
You know, just recently we had a false prophet die. Harold Camping passed away. Don't ask me where he is. I don't know. None of my business. But you know who he was. Three different times that we know of that he came out publicly claiming that he knew when this rapture was going to happen and would, you know, kickstart the beginning of the second coming, that he knew when it was, going against scripture after scripture. And he had this whole mathematical plan worked out. I mean, this whole thing devised. You know, the man was a preacher, but the man was, was not trained in theology. He had no degree work uh, in any kind of exegetical training, historical theology, nothing like that. The man was an engineer. Blueprints were his thing. Not this. You see? you got to be careful who you gather yourself around relative to who you're going to trust to interpret this, this book. And I'll tell you what, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you, and the Holy Spirit is real good at red-lighting you when you're listening to somebody that is not right. And you stay in this book enough, you will recognize when somebody is telling you the truth and when somebody is not. That's why we painstakingly go through verse by verse by verse. And we just don't leave it in English. We get into the original language. And then we compare passages with other passages. And we show you the full Monty here in regards to where this subject is taught throughout Scripture. So you have a handle on it just like this. But Harold Camping just died. The last time he did this whole thing, Thing. You remember, it was, it was recent here, within the last, what, year or something, two years or something like that, I forget. And I mean, billboards all over the United States, he had it going off over into Asia and around the world, you know, so many hours, so many days and so many hours left. You know, forget the fact that Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. Just forget that, you know, if you held to that. Even if you were a futurist, you knew better than to, to, to say that, and they were all. All of our futurist friends were, you know, saying that. But, you know, here it comes, you know. And I mean, the man died a wreck. The man left this planet disgraced. I mean, I read his, his little apology and things like that. There's no way you can make up for things like this. The amount of lives people trusted themselves into his hands, into this, into this man's hands. How did this happen? The guy wasn't trained in any of this. Couldn't read Greek, couldn't read Hebrew. People were, were trusting that he could rightly divide this word of truth, and he wasn't equipped. Would you take your child who was sick to a doctor who said, well, I didn't graduate from medical school, but I really mean well. Would you do that? Or would you take him to the guy who was qualified? Well, I think we all know what the answer is for that. And by the way, by saying that, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, just because a guy gets sheepskins and, and gets degrees, that that makes him qualified. The proof is in the pudding. It's what he does with it, that information, that, that makes a difference, you see. Because you know when you're tasting good food. You know when you're tasting that which has been cooked up and served up to you. And you want to keep coming back. You know where the good restaurant is. And so you keep coming back to it. That's why, see, you still are listening to me after all this time. <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> you know, you're still out there. I'm telling you, move to Omaha. Because I can't get these people to move. I mean, I can't. I've tried. Uh... It's cold here. And the wind's really been blowing here. <laughs> Omaha, this is my home. I love this place because God's called me here. This is where I'm supposed to be. So, you know, we're kind of like half kidding, I guess, when we tell people, move to Omaha. Might as well. There's plenty of work here. I guess, I hope. In any case, all these things, this poor guy, Harold Camping, and all the people and all the lives that he destroyed. And the man believed that, he didn't believe any of these things that I've been showing you. And the Bible is stacked with it. It is stuffed with it. All the Bible has ever taught has been what's known as the preterist, past and fulfillment point of view. That's all it's ever taught. It's never taught anything else. It's never taught anything that's been ascribed to it throughout the history of the church. You say, man, that's the thing that I just can't get past, you know. Well, the, fact, the frank fact of the matter is, is that the church has been wrong. You've got to take a stand. 
you got to take a stand. If you're going to say you believe that this is what is taught in Scripture, you have to be able to prove it. And if all of your proofs, and you still got Jesus coming, you know, sometime out in the future right there, and it all keeps hitting the ground like it does, and you've got guys like Harold Camping believing the same thing, dying in disgrace, the wreck of people's lives, and I don't mind telling you, I learned some stuff from Harold Camping in the years past. He was a pretty good Calvinist, but he lost it somewhere along the way. How did it happen? I don't know. He didn't have any accountability, that's for sure. That's a biggie right there. Ladies and gentlemen, futurism will never tell you the truth. When we use that term futurism, we mean the second coming and the, uh, and the adjoining uh, features to that second coming are still off in the future. As long as you're holding to that point of view, it will never tell you the truth. You know why? Because it's not equipped to tell you the truth. It's not equipped. It doesn't come with the ability to unlock the text of Scripture. It doesn't come with that. I've heard it. I've heard it for as long as I've been a preterist. I don't know how long I've been a preterist now, but I hear it all the time, especially from new preterists. They'll say to me, man, it just, it, as soon as I saw that the second coming was at AD 70, it was at the destruction of the temple, in that same generation, all of this Bible just started to open up for me. Everything just started coming open. It was all locked up before. And I'm not saying that preterist point of view, you know, is the answer to all of our problems in regards to understanding Scripture. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when it comes to this subject of eschatology, this is what the Bible teaches. And people have told me that for years. Everything just opens up. It all makes sense. If I had a dime for every time somebody used that phrase on me, it all makes sense now. We could buy us our own building instead of renting one. Well, we're done now. We're done. The Lord bless you huge. Now, we're in Matthew 24, just started the Olivet Discourse. Verse 3, it's where I've ended. It means we're going to pick up on the fourth verse next week, Lord willing. We'll just kind of fire right off into that. We ought to be able to make a little bit more headway uh, this time. This is Dr. Kelly Nelson Burks. We do want you to visit the website, uh, our Messiah Reformed Church website, drkellynelsonburks.com. Do think about maybe some questions you might have for me for our special question and answer installment. We'll do it as soon as we're done with the Olivet Discourse. And you can write them to me at ktestifytotruth at aol.com. Follow us on Twitter at Dr. Kelly Burks, at Dr. Kelly Burks. And you can also go to our Facebook page. Gosh, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? You can go to our Facebook. Hey, we've got a we've got a special mission on Mars. You know, you can go there too. Our Facebook page. Just type in Messiah Reform Church Omaha, and you ought to be able to get right onto that. Go like us. Go like us. My my wife likes seeing those numbers go up. She says to me the other day, "We've got two more people who like us." <laughs> okay, we'll be back next week with another installment. God bless you. Take care. <laughs>